The first real estate investment trust or REIT listed an ARC on the exchanges in our country in April 2019, and that was Embassy Office Parks REIT. We have three REITs in our country so far. Perhaps if the pandemic had not intervened, we may have had more. In other words, this is still a nascent investment vehicle. To know more about it, we spoke to Ritwik Bhattacharji, Chief Investment Officer, Embassy Office Parks REIT. And he tells us that if you're looking for a product that is liquid, that has high corporate governance standards, that makes a lot of disclosures, is tightly regulated, and offers the retail investor a mix of dividend yield and capital appreciation, a REIT is the product to go for. Do watch this interview for to learn more about this product. Welcome to our show, Mr. Bhattacharji. Thank you, Sanjay. Good morning and nice to see you. Thank you for having me. Our goal for this interview will be to touch upon those subjects which uh, a retail investor should be aware of before he invests in a REIT. My first question to you is, how does a REIT, how does a REIT operate? How does it make money for its investors? Sure, Th uh, thanks for that. In a very sort of fundamental sense, a REIT stands for Real Estate Investment Trust. It's been a product that's been around globally for, for 60 years, uh, spearheaded by its emergence in the US. And it's probably the most riskless way, if you can say that, for, in, for retail investors to participate in commercial real estate. Commercial real estate being the, the cash flow that comes from rentals that tenants play across a variety of industries, whether it's, uh, you know, it could be office, it could be malls, it could be a number of other sectors, hotels, a number of sectors. And you can also participate in the upside that comes from the growth in these sectors and the demand for the product. Let me put that into perspective in India. In, right now, there are three office uh, REITs. In, Embassy REIT was the first one to list. Uh, we listed in 2019. And since then, we've had, uh, we've distributed uh, over 6,000 crores to our investors. We've leased over 6.4 million square feet to world-class multinational tenants that are household names, whether it's um, a JP Morgan, whether it's a Google, it's companies that are part of the Dow 30, the S&P 500, and India's you know, biggest technology and other companies. That Those rentals are effectively net of expenses and financings of what we distribute to unit holders. And they also get to participate in the upside of the capital appreciation that comes from the growth in our in our portfolio. So from the rental escalations, as demand increases, as uh, the, the development that we bring online from the buildings that we own and operate, and effectively from the growth that we can buy from buying external acquisitions. Uh, as we demonstrated when we bought uh, an acquisition through, uh, through the pandemic. So effectively, what retail investors get is the distributions from the cash flows that are growing as, the, 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 as we own and professionally manage our office parks, and they get to share in the, in, in the capital appreciation. They should, they should also understand that from a risk perspective, this is not like traditional real estate that they've been used to in India. There is no speculative land bank. We have to have in 80% of our portfolio by value has to be income generating because that's the source of the distributions. And the 20% cannot be speculative. It's not land. It's effectively development that at some point we will continue to construct and give to market uh, and bring it into the completed bucket of our portfolio. Currently, we have 4.6 million square feet of that that we're, that we're working on to, to co construct and eventually build the market. So to, to sum up, it's probably the riskless way to pay, play real estate uh, with a, in a liquid, transparent, and a highly regulated form. So what are some of the advantages of going for a REIT rather than invest in a commercial property directly? I think simply put, it's probably a less risky uh, avenue to do it, uh, to, to invest in real estate and, and reach for bills so that retail investors have that liquidity. So, so let me put it into uh, some context. A REIT is liquid, which means that you can trade it like a stock on a stock exchange. In fact, it is a stock. We think of it as a, a, as a share. You can buy one uh, unit of a REIT uh, the same way as you can buy one share of any listed equity. The second is it's transparent. If you look at the amount of disclosure that we 
actually put out there in the market uh, every quarter. It pretty much sort of dwarfs a lot of the disclosure that a lot of listed companies do. So you have always have a transparent view into how we're leasing the business, all the trends in the business. And we've been able to do this, to, I mean, we've been doing this through, through the pandemic. We've been doing this sort of since we've listed because our goal was to really give retail investors and the bro and all our stakeholders the best possible view into a world-class sort of disclosure standard. The third is the, the level of governance in the REIT is something that is really has sort of transformed the real estate sector in this country. We have an independent uh, board that uh, that sits alongside the nominee directors and the managers. We are constantly uh, working with our regulators to streamline the safety of uh, the, the the sector and making sure that unit holders are provided the most amount of disclosure and have complete uh, as, as much uh, safety as possible. In private real estate, that becomes very difficult because it's illiquid, number one, you can't trade it very freely. Number two, it's opaque because you don't have sort of the access to the disclosure and how the property is actually managed and where is that reporting process taking place, uh, unlike us where we disclose every quarter, we distribute our, uh, every quarter, even though we're only required to do it half yearly. And on top of that, there's really, there's no governance per se in a, in a, in a private setup. Somebody takes uh, is effectively pooling capital together, running the process, and then after that, I think you always run the potentially run the risk of if something goes wrong, then how do you get out, or what exactly are the parameters that you can actually look at? So, REITs tend to be, given they're publicly traded and highly regulated, tend to be just better avenues for retail investors to invest safely in commercial real estate. What are some of the SEBI mandated regulations that make REIT a safer bet for the retail investor? If you could touch upon a couple of points. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so, so first and foremost, uh, from a semi perspective, this is, we have to be have eighty percent of our uh, assets in uh, income producing uh, real estate. There, there, there really is sort of no sort of leeway for that. We have to make sure that it's that all our parts, and, and it, it makes sense if you think about the fact that that th those cash flows are effectively the foundation of the distributions that we give to unit holders. Uh, the, the, the second uh, aspect is that there is a very strong bar on making sure that, uh, you know, there is any sort of pricing on any acquisitions and transactions will require, you know, unit holders, particularly with related party transactions. A lot of the growth in the past has, for the sector itself, has come from sponsor, by, uh, sponsor assets. And, that, and one of the main sort of avenues is to make sure that while we can use that as growth, we should always be beyond a certain uh, level of size, beyond a certain level of, uh, if you think about the pricing, that always has to be something that requires two independent valuers. It requires, if you're financing it, it requires it needs to be taken to unit holders. And um, the third avenue that I would probably say that is very important is that there are very strict safeguards on leverage. The real estate in this country historically has been a victim of high excessive leverage. What the REIT's been able to uh, really circumvent that and do is have a very clean balance sheet. We are lowly levered. We have our, our, our leverage levels around 27%. We have uh, the regulatory approval to go up to 49% of total capitalization. But I think, you know, fundamentally, what we've always uh, kept an eye on is making sure that we have some proof, we, we manage our capital and our balance sheet very prudently, particularly if you think about the risks of uh, what a pandemic does to our balance sheet. It's ultimately a financing vehicle. You, you run using sources of capital, so you want to make sure that your cost of capital is, uh, is low. We brought ours down from 9.5% on the debt side to 6.5% during the pandemic. So we're always making sure that leverage is not uh, a concern simply because it has been a concern in real estate uh, in the past. And in this kind of a financing environment, we want to make sure that it's as risk-free as, as possible. What are some of the possible risks that a retail investor faces when he invests in a REIT? Yeah, I think I, fun, fundamentally, uh, Sanjay, the, uh, you know, the, the, the biggest risk is uh, potentially the risk that we uh, we saw over the last couple of years. Uh, like when you think about, you know, where we were, we, so we, Embassy Reed listed in 2019, we delivered 2.4 million square feet. 
uh, of leasing that first year of our listing and was arguably you know one of the best performing REITs uh, office REITs globally but then you enter into a position where there is uh, you know a pandemic a global pandemic where the entire sort of thesis of your business is potentially put at risk because people aren't coming to the office uh, and if the demand isn't there, then that certainly then puts pressure on distributions, pressure on, you know, do you shut down offices? As we saw, there was so much, uh, you know, angst and so much, uh, you know, concern around the future of, of office. But, but even in that time, you know, we delivered, uh, you know, close to sort of a million square feet of, of leasing a year. We, did a, we collected 100% of our rents. We maintained sort of a balance sheet that, you know, achieved 300 basis points of uh, risk adjusted for financing. And we were able to even buy growth because we were able to buy an asset. So, so I think the fundamental risk is always thinking about sort of the demand. But we feel that, you know, Indian office is a very stable, mature class, uh, asset class for a REIT, which is why, you know, we were the first REIT to list. We have the best sort of assets in the portfolio to actually, in, in India's gateway office markets. So what we were able to do was, you know, bring this portfolio to market. We've grown it since that uh, time and really are constantly thinking about, you know, de-risking uh, the portfolio to deliver returns. Could you elaborate on how a REIT compensates its investors? If you could simplify it for our viewers. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so the way that you, you should think about a REIT is you, you play it for two reasons. You play it effectively for income, which is the distributions that you get. And that's obviously tax adjusted depending on your tax bracket, depending on the, the, how, how you actually receive receive that income but that you should think of a read as being a high dividend stock with a huge element of growth involved there right so if i have to put embassy read as sort of the, the the foundation of sort of where a read in india how an in read in india operates you, you so we've delivered call it you know 50 over 50 percent in returns now that return is if i break it down it's an average of around 15 percent uh every over 15 percent every year half of that is the distribution of the dividend yield that you get and the rest is the capital appreciation that you would get in the stock that capital appreciation and the growth is underpinned by the growth levers we have in our business one is the lease lease uh, re rentals on average there's a mark to market uh, what we call a mark to market reversion when a lease expires and it's a legacy lease that has been uh, a, a, an office tenant, a big company has leased out at maybe a low rate. And if they vacate the new lease, because the growth for Indian talent and because the Indian labor pool is, is high and, and Indian technology, uh, the, the Indian average Indian technology talent pool is probably the best in the world, which is why people come here. There's anywhere from a 25 to 35 percent, even more, you know, reversion in the rents. So that's one. The second is your, we have sort of all this development in our in our parks that we build, we construct. It, we already own the economics of the land that we put into the market that gets leased up at these new market rents. So that's that's number two. And then you think about effectively as we buy growth, we want an acquisition uh, of you know 10 million square feet back during the pandemic. That in Bangalore's best office market, in the the asset was Embassy Tech Village. That it's it's effectively a zero a, a, a sub five percent vacancy market. If you think about sort of how those rentals, the the demand for our product in that market, um, you know, continues to grow, particularly after the pandemic. That's the third kind of lever of growth that we 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 continue to sort of uh, think about um, you know add to the portfolio and and lastly our, our internal you know the, the rent itself of 15 percent every three years uh roughly around a five percent every year and you know we, we collect 100 percent of our rents they escalate we collect the escalations that all adds to the distributions and the overall growth that investors can expect from a lease. At present, you have only three reads in the country, but one can envisage a situation where there will be perhaps 50 or 100, just like stocks and shares. How does an investor select a read once there are a lot of them? What criteria should he apply? Yeah, let, 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 if I may just address the first part of that question, if you wouldn't mind. So, so I think you know you mentioned the one that there are only three reads in the market. I, I, I mean, I'd like to flip that on its head a little bit and 
say that it, it's actually a fantastic outcome for a sector that prior to embassy REIT listing and paving the way for the REIT market, uh, Indian real estate was clearly looked upon with a lot of skepticism by the global community investment community. I think we fundamentally changed the nature of, of the commercial real estate market in the country. So, and you have to remember that as a part of that, we also did that just before the onset of probably one of the greatest black swan events in the pandemic. What that did then, despite the pandemic affecting probably one of the, the most sensitive office uh, and sensitive markets to to a, biz, uh, to a sort of an event of this nature, two other REITs also listed in this sector. They were able to collect the rent. They continue to perform very well. So I think it's, it's actually been a terrific you know, start to what promises to be a long runway for REITs. And our regulators have been fantastic. You know, they have nurtured the, the product. They have been open to a lot of feedback. And I'm talking about the securities regulator, the banking regulator, the insurance regulator. There's been a lot of excitement and a lot of, uh, you know, pleasure that people have sort of, you know, derived from watching our performance. So I think that sort of really sets the foundation for REITs in the future in this country. Now, will there be 50 or 100 REITs? I don't, I'm, I'm not so sure about sort of, you know, I, I can pinpoint a number, but I think, you know, Indian office has been obviously the most mature and the stable asset class. But I think over time, as more sectors continue to grow in the infrastructure place, whether you think about, you know, retail, whether you think about, you know, logistics, warehousing, data centers, over time, as asset classes mature, real estate asset classes mature and give you the cash flows that you can drop down into distributions and grow, yes, you will, so we certainly expect to see sort of more, more reads. The other thing that, that I think really uh, is, is a big catalyst for that is just understanding the, the fact that you should be able to have cheap access to financing, which, which really is the most important sort of avenue for a REIT to operate efficiently and to be able to manage its cost of capital. Now, to the second part of your question, uh, you know, if you can just think about, you know, what, what should an investor look for as the REIT market uh, grows, it's fundamentally you have to look at uh, a uh, the nature of what, what the underlying business is. Commercial real estate uh, can be many things. But office has been the most readable sector in India simply because it's the most mature asset class. The, the demand for Indian talent in India from multinational companies continues to be immense and has obviously been the low hanging fruit for the REIT sector. Now, within that, you obviously want to be in gateway office markets like we are. You have to have a professional management team, very good ownership of uh, and sponsorship, we've been backed by Embassy Group and Blackstone, two leaders in real estate, uh, both in India and globally. I think the ability to manage the entire uh, in the operations, uh, you know, in a manner that's really provided both growth as well as safety to investors. The governance uh, of the REIT, the disclosure of uh, the materials that we put out and our communications with investors and broader stakeholders. And really, I think fundamentally look for businesses which continue to deliver A, growth, B, cash, and have wide moats, right? And you have to be in the right market. You have to be able to make strategic decisions now. And that effectively is sort of, you know, what will drive an investor's decision to invest in, 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 in a company or in a REIT. What is the moat within a REIT? If you could. Well, one, yeah, one, one is location, number one. If, if, if you think about, I mean, we have Bangalore as being 70% of our portfolio by value, and we've got, you know, two 10 million square feet parks. We've got another, you know, 4.7 million, 4.2 million park in, in a cash rate area that continues to be 100% occupied. The biggest thing is you want to be in markets where people will want to uh, set up their own office, set up their offices. Bangalore, for example, and just going on that example of what that mode is, it is the market where it India's the hottest and most thriving market for, for labor. It is India's hot, biggest office market. It's around, you know, call it 150 million square feet. Young people want to come and work there. It's got great schools. It's got a great environment. And it's a fertile ground for, you know, the, the big, the, the Facebooks, the Googles, the JP Morgans of the world, 
to hire from. And I think if you have sort of a dominant presence in a market like that, that effectively constitutes the moat. And that moat only deepens as you build more, you're constantly upgrading your, your facilities and your parks and building total ecosystems of, you know, whether it's food courts, whether it's sort of the infrastructure that we provided with a flyover that allows sort of uh, the, the right kind of, you know, transportation environment. And I mean, look, in India, traffic tends to be a concern. You want to make sure that you contribute to that total, the environment around the parks and create these infrastructure like parks where it makes it very hard for a tenant to actually leave. Right? once you come in, you've got, they, they, they really don't want to, if you're in a, in a, in a park where you've got sort of, you know, 20,000 employees who, that are working in, in and, and are living around the area, why would you go somewhere else? And that's why you, you invest in a community. And that is, I think, the biggest part of the mode. The second is, uh, the, the second part of the mode is really being able to have the best execution of the management team to run it. I think fundamentally, like I said, the ability to instill confidence amongst global investors, to, to be able to, to talk to your financiers, to be able to sort of deliver sort of the returns that you keep talking about. And, and to do it in a manner that's you know that's efficient and quarter on quarter, you, you know, these are the kinds of management teams and these are the kinds of businesses that I think investors will good ones will separate from their, uh, differentiate themselves from others. How much have you been able to? Uh, how much dividend have you been able to distribute to investors since say inception? So, yeah, since so since inception, effectively we've given out. Roughly on uh, just over six thousand crores in um, in three years and one in and one quarter. So it's how sort much of would that be a, in uh, percentage terms annually? How much would that be? Yeah, so so roughly, I think given that the stock price has also sort of you know performed fairly stably, it's roughly call it around uh, a six to six and a half percent dividend yield. Uh, but you've also got to, you have to look at that uh, in within uh, with with sort of the the context of also the capital appreciation. So on average, if you're delivering around 14 to 15 percent a year, that's around 8 percent capital uh, appreciation. So it's around a mid-teens, what we call total return. About 14 to 15 percent is what your REIT has delivered investors. Yeah. Okay. In 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 in, in dividends and. And, and share price and capital appreciation. Yeah. And what kind of investor should ideally go for a REIT? Should it be um, people who are looking for regular income? Should it be people who are looking for capital appreciation? It, it, it's a combination of both. And then if I, if I may just go back to the uh, previous question a little bit, I think if you juxtapose sort of our return, let me just give you a quick snapshot of what that return for this year the three REITs on average have delivered sort of over a 10% return. Uh, just even if you think about the stock price, whereas one of the benchmark realty index in indices in this country is sort of is down roughly around 7% for equity, for listed real estate equity. So I think you talk about sort of the stability and the structure um, of what a REIT does. And I think it, it, it's definitely acted as an inflation head and the inflation hedge as well, if people are looking for that, because there is sort of that safety and the visibility into the cash flows. Uh, to your question, what, what kinds of investors, this is, a, a, a REIT Sanjay is, uh, I mean, the perfect vehicle for a retail investor to invest in commercial real estate. I think if you think about real estate being uh, an integral part of a lot of Indians' asset allocation strategy, you know, the ability, some people play it through, through resident, most of Indian residential real, listed real estate tends to be in residential. Yes, there is some office that contributes a part of those portfolios, but uh, private real estate has always been also a big part of, uh, you know, Indian real estate portfolios. But I think, I mean, this provides, the, for, for a retail investor of any, you know, you don't have to be sort of an HNI, you can be a regular investor who's looking to sort of add, if you're looking for real commercial real estate exposure, a REIT is the ideal way to go, go about and do it. Just to give, put some context around it, glo uh, the global REIT uh, market capitalization is roughly around $2 trillion. Uh, America tends to sort of have around $1.4 trillion of listed REIT exposure. It's been very difficult for historically in emerging markets like like you know whether it's in India, it's in China, or in markets where 
for people to actually invest in real in, in listed real estate or for the REIT sector to actually flourish until now. Because the main issue is getting the regulations right. To your point about you know why are they why are they also only being free? It's it takes a long time to make sure that the regulations get together come together in a way that protects retail investors. All of that is taking place. The evolution of that landscape is now making it the ideal point for retail investors of any size, no matter what your sort of risk or your return or your horizon is. This, if you believe in sort of the long-term foundations and the underlying foundations of the business, and we do, we, we it's a decadal story. If you think about India, office, consumption, the growth, the market, the talent, the labor, it is the ideal product for an investor to take, take part in that kind of upside that we eventually will see. Our returns from REITs stable enough for us, say a senior citizen to invest in it? Can he depend on it for his, say, to meet his uh, regular income needs? Yeah, yes, I think, I mean, I mean let, me, let me put that into context. Uh, the short answer is yes, because if you look at our, what we've done, we have, we've been listed for effectively 13 quarters since April 2019 in within that pandemic as well. If you are looking for cash that's coming out every quarter, we will pay you that cash. It's 90% of net distributable cash flows that we put out into the market. That by nature, by regulation, we have to do. We've actually paid out 100% of our cash flows every quarter. We actually were required to do that every half year, but but I think we've gone above and beyond to make sure. So if, if it is something that we're looking for for cash, uh, it is something that you should certainly say that yes, it is dependable. Now I'm not going to give a senior citizen advice, uh, investment advice. It really depends on obviously horizons and and just general tolerance levels. But I think in general the, the structure is not like I I'll go back to the original point. We are not a speculative play. I think if you we are, we have there's a lot of underlying growth and embedded growth in our business simply because we are in the right right sector. But at the same time, what we don't want to sort of ever be is something that people like I said we can't invest in man. We're not out there to take on sort of you know speculative sort of you know development that may or may not that that could potentially threaten the cash flow. So if that is your if you're looking for cash out of this business, and whether you're a senior citizen or someone starting out investing, that that cash we will deliver to you because we are required to deliver it to you. What should be the minimum investment horizon for a person investing in a REIT? I, you know, I, I personally, I, I as an investor, I'm a long-term investor, and I think that everybody should sort of you know, not be not speculate. I think if you think about, it really depends on what your need as you build out a, a, a. It should be a sensible part of any investment portfolio. You think about, you know, whether it's even even with equity, you know, you shouldn't be trading. And my personal view is, you don't trade in and out. But but I think if you're thinking about sort of you know. Uh, Five-year horizon and beyond, as you think through, you know, the the, the growth of of real estate through a cycle, through a rising cycle. I think anything less than that becomes, you know, very difficult to sort of really see the true upside. I'll put that into sort of context around, you know, we we've been listed for three years. In those three years, like I said, we've seen a pandemic for two of them. Uh, the, the 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 structure is still evolving. The market is still nascent. There's a lot of growth that as we come out of a pandemic, and once you've dealt with a pandemic, and now you start thinking about you know what the upside for the product is, what the upside for the leasing demand is up. We continue to see a lot of growth in this country from from people coming in here, uh, global companies setting up their global captive centers. I think the, the optimism in India post this pandemic, I think, it has, has has never been greater. Now, to avail of the full upside of this, we see hospitals. We own, we own hotels. Our hotels are now beginning to pick up an occupancy. We've launched two hotels uh, in one of our biggest parks in Bangalore recently that are doing phenomenally well. To avail of all this upside, I think we've really got to sit here and watch the trajectory of this business grow o o over a few years. And I think that sort of really puts you in line with the fundamentals of how we look at the business, how we operate the business, and you really sit with us over the long term. And I think. It's it, what's been heartening, Sanjay, is we had our first annual meeting uh, uh, in person post the pandemic this year. And, you know, there, there, there were a lot of people coming up to the mic and actually sort of telling us, you know, how gratifying it was to see management in person. And they were holders since the IPO. 
So, you know, having seen, and it's very, just as a management team, it was lovely to hear that. And I think the fundamentally to see, you know, a, a retail shareholder base grow from, you know, roughly around 4,000 at IPO to over 50,000 today, is I think the biggest sort of, you know, endorsement of what the product can and, and, and is able to do for, for the retail base. Thank you, Mr. Bhattacharya. It has been a pleasure speaking to you. You have made a very convincing case for REITs. I'm sure that our viewers will gain immensely from this interaction. Thank you and goodbye. Thank, thank, thank you, Sanjay. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and I really hope that the message uh, you know, reaches your, uh, your, your base. And uh, if you do encourage your, all, our, all your viewers to take a look at our website at ir.nbcofficeparks.com. There's a wealth of information about the product. Uh, we believe that you know, there's a lot of education that still needs to be done, and we really look forward to interacting with uh, you and, and our investors soon. Thank you, and goodbye.